to the UK. The outcomes of the FTA provide a range of market improvements across horticulture products, presenting a renewed opportunity for Australian fresh produce exporters considering entering or growing in the market. Delivered in collaboration with Horn Innovation, this virtual session offers Australian-based horticulture growers and exporters an opportunity to hear from government and industry experts in order to understand, better understand the UK market, learn about those tariff improvements and how businesses can access and maximise, hear from Horn Innovation on, its, on key outcome of its consumer research in the market, and engage with our teams via the interactive Q&A session. Uh, in addition to our great speakers from Austrade and Horticulture Innovation, we are also very fortunate to have joining us Wayne Prowse, our Principal and Senior Analyst at Fresh Intelligence Consulting, who will be with us during the panel session. But before we get into content, into the content, I have a few helpful housekeeping items just to run through quickly. Uh, just please be aware that this session is being recorded. Uh, and, and as what is customary with webinars, um, please do stay on mute. Um, and if you could please keep your camera off if you're not presenting, that would also be appreciated. Uh, we hope you have a good technical experience, but if you do drop, drop out of the session, don't worry. The key information about the webinar will be available for your review in the coming days. The session will finish with a panel discussion where you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our speakers. Um, to ask a question, please use the chat function in WebEx. Uh, we won't be answering questions as we go um, or during the presentations, but feel free to jump in and get a head start if you want to submit some questions. All right, um, we've got through the housekeeping, so let's get into it. First, I'd like to invite Anna Nishtiansky, Austrade's Trade and Investment Commissioner in London, to give us an overview of the UK market. Thanks very much, Phil, and uh, good afternoon to everyone in Australia. Good morning to anyone joining us um, from the UK or, or Europe. It's wonderful to see so many of you on the call today. Um, as Phil mentioned, I will facilitate some questions at the end, so please do put some questions in the chat box. Um, it would be great to um, hear from you and obviously respond to any questions questions that you might have of the panel. Um, look, uh, I'm very excited to be doing this. Uh, I'm very glad that Australia and HIA were able to uh, partner to deliver this briefing to you. And it's fantastic that Wayne uh, is also able to join us to give a bit of an independent industry perspective on this. Um, while the UK and Australia have been strong um, trading partners for many years, um, what was what is quite interesting and Rising to a point is that when it comes to um, trade um, on agricultural products and exports of agricultural products from Australia to the UK, they've all they've been quite low over the past um, 50 years. Um, you know, U UK actually imports half of food that is consumed in the UK, so they do actually import a lot of food. And of course, Europe is close and Europe's in proximity, so there's no surprise that they source a lot from Europe, but 40% of their imports do come from outside of EU, so they do come from other countries outside of EU, and Australia accounts for less than 1% of those imports um, that come from outside of EU. Um, so I think there's definitely opportunity there. Um, I, I think on the other side, if we talk about Australian exports, uh, obviously we export a lot of our cultural products, uh, but UK is not even in the 10 export markets um, for Australian agricultural exports. And uh, the last I checked, uh, Australian agricultural exports to the UK presented only 1.5% of the total Australian um, agricultural exports. So once again, really small numbers there, which I think in itself presents an opportunity. Um, why that's the case, um, I think we all know, and you yourself would have very much experienced that there's been a lot of uh, barriers in place, uh, some significant tariffs that have been in place, some complex customs procedures. And what we're hoping that is that the free trade agreement um, uh, with removal of many of those tariffs um, elimination of those tariffs from the 31st of May um, and through streamlining customs procedures will um, help address some of those barriers and enable us to facilitate more flow of Australian agricultural exports um, to the UK. So with that in mind, I'm actually going to hand over to my um, colleague, Alberto Oliver. Alberto is our Senior Business Development Manager looking after our agricultural sector. Um, and he will take you through a bit of information about the UK market, um, what's happening from a perspective of um, horticulture in the UK um, and where those opportunities might lie. And uh, Alberto and I will tag team to talk a little bit about the FTA 
today um, as well before we break into the panel session. So um, with that in mind, over to you, Alberto. Thank you very much, Anna, and good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, depending where you are joining us from. Uh, so, as Anna has mentioned, we're going to cover four uh, main areas. Uh, I'm going to start with a few insights from the UK market. We'll cover a few uh, um, aspects of the FTA as well, technical market access, and there's the final slide or part on, on, on the importer and how UK importers uh, think. Uh, I'll, I'll go directly to um, uh, the UK market insights to give you a bit of an overview. Some of this information you might already be familiar with, but uh, I really hope that. Uh, you can get some new information from 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 this presentation today. Um, uh, most importantly, we have to still think about uh, the consumption of uh, of fresh produce in the UK. As Anna said, uh, the UK imports uh, a lot of food, uh, and and we wanted to give you an overview of uh, of the actual import uh, um, um, uh, of, of of fresh produce. So we thought it's it's better to start maybe with um, the consumption of those products and and what the UK market is actually consuming uh, for uh, fruit and bets, for example. Um, we see uh, in this first slide. Um, uh, the fresh vegetables are uh, the biggest part of the consumption in the UK market for fresh produce, with 44, 45.1% uh, in the in the last year, uh, followed by fresh fruit as well. Uh, and then we go to the processed categories, processed vegetables and processed fruit as, as, as well. So we see uh, 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 which categories are being consumed uh, more than others. But also, most importantly, we see what the total revenue of the sector has been or is in the UK. There's an estimation of uh, uh, £12.7 billion uh, for 2024. And there's an estimated growth in 2023 and 2024 of 1.1%, meaning that the industry, the UK food industry is clearly demanding, the market is clearly demanding these products and 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 uh, it's clearly demanding it through different channels. Um, where are these products being sold? We thought it will be also important for you to understand and to know this uh, because it might be different to other markets you, you, you work in, uh, uh, you're working on and, and the main place to sell these products, the main channels to sell these products in the UK are supermarkets, green grocers, Food service operators um, 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 are smaller, but it's still important. And then we include others as well. We'll analyze through this presentation uh, how these products are being brought to market, if they are directly being brought to market by uh, supermarkets, or what is the real uh, role of the importers in here. Uh, but we'll analyze this a bit later in the presentation. Just wanted to give you a very um, a basic overview and picture in this first slide. Most importantly, I think. And we thought it would be important for you to know uh, a few trends in 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 market uh, uh, to have that general picture um, in here. Um, so first of all, the UK market, as you probably might know, but I, I can confirm that it's heavily reliant on imports, especially for fruit. I have to say, fruit and veg and uh, fresh produce in general is very reliant on imports. They cannot cover all the demand they have internally. Um, a very recent trend is that uh, supermarkets uh, are offering fruit and veg uh, at lower prices. They're winning. What does it? What does it mean? This basically means that uh, there is an internal, uh, let's say, battle of prices among supermarkets to get uh, fresh produce at cheaper price if possible, uh, and 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 those that are offering better prices seem to be uh, winning the race uh, to increase their sales. Also important, and I will go into details on this one later. Supermarkets have started to bypass the wholesale, the importer uh, of the supply chain, uh, uh, and dealing directly with um, growers. Not all of them, but some of them. We'll analyze this later, see which ones are doing what, etc. And uh, important to uh, think that consumers are increasingly seeking um, to add fruits and veg to the diet. Uh, this is kind of a consequence of COVID. We have seen an increasing uh, demand for fresh produce after COVID in the UK, and some reports uh, link it directly to. Um, health issues that we have had in uh, in the UK because of COVID, etc., but also because of some UK government uh, campaigns to improve the diet uh, in, the, in the UK. Uh, consumers are generally concerned about the environmental impact of the food. We'll analyse this one uh, a bit further uh, later as well, see how Australian um, producers can still be competitive uh, despite the distance and uh, things like carbon footprint, etc. Uh, because this is certainly um, something that has increased in the last years, the concern uh, on the environmental impact uh, that um, this apple or orange uh, that I'm eating in the UK um, has. Having said that, uh, and after uh, giving that initial general picture on the UK market, I want to look at the numbers. 
And this table here shows you where the UK is importing the fresh produce from. I have separated into EU, non-EU imports. Um, you can see, um, and I have highlighted in here a couple of things. The first one I wanted to mention is the edible veg, uh, vegetables, certain roots and tubers. You can see that certainly the non-EU countries um, are less than half, represent less than half of the imports into the UK. But I have to say that looking at data from previous years, uh, then the, the importance of non-EU countries uh, uh, um, regarding these categories has increased a lot. So there is a trend of more or less um, um, increasing uh, non-EU imports uh, for this category uh, compared to EU imports. And most importantly, I believe if we compare non-EU imports uh, non-EU countries sourcing uh, batch into the UK, uh, there's a lot of diversity here. And something, and I will uh, go into detail on this later, that we have received, the feedback that we have received from many, many importers in the UK, is that if we just compare non-EU countries, Australia can clearly be very competitive, uh, might not be competitive in, in pricing, for example, as we will see later, but they can, we can be competitive uh, in things like sustainable practices, labour practices, etc. Because some of these non-EU countries don't have the same standards that we do in Australia. And this is a competitive advantage that we definitely have to explore load and we definitely have to use when talking to importers. Regarding the fruit, uh, clearly we can see that non-EU imports uh, are more important than EU imports. Again, this is something that has been growing a lot in the last years. Uh, so there's a clear trend of the UK sourcing more and more from non-European countries, or at least non-EU countries. Again, something we can also um, uh, use uh, for the UK market, if we only look at the non-EU import countries, is about those sustainable practices that we're using and, and label practices as well, which are also very important in the UK. So we can use that extra point in order to differentiate ourselves from other countries from uh, non-EU uh, areas that might be sourcing the UK. So uh, I believe that this gives a very clear picture on uh, where the UK is sourcing its products from uh, in a very general way, of course, uh, and, and also um, what um, the Australian industry can use to um, uh, sell themselves better, let's say, that way in, in, in the UK. Just going a bit more into detail, uh, um, I just wanted to give an overview of, of the two main categories for fresh produce. Um, for, for fruit, we have to think that the UK uh, imports around 83% 80, 80, of, 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 that, of, of that category. Is a lot. Uh, there is a domestic production, really small one, but that has been increasing for certain categories uh, uh, from 15% to 17% in 2022. Uh, I will say this is not for all the categories. I mean, they cannot produce locally all the categories. This is mainly concentrated into some berries, for example, uh, some apples as well, even though they still uh, need some import. Uh, so this doesn't apply to all uh, to all the categories, um, um, which is good news for us. Uh, but for example, yes. To give you some specific uh, insights on, on some categories, the avocado sector grew last year around 14% uh, on the base of uh, 90,000 tones. Uh, cranberries and blueberries is also the best performing category in 2022, uh, and, and there's been a sales rising by 7% uh, to 35,000 tones last year only. Um, Generally speaking, the trend for the next years is that there's going to be some increase, as we have seen before. Uh, for fruit, it's going to be an increase more or less around uh, to around 3.1 million tonnes by 2026. Um, in the other category, for the bets category, uh, the UK approximately grows around 55% of its vegetable requirements. Again, it doesn't apply to all the categories, uh, so uh, it, it, it mainly concentrates in two and three products. Uh, generally speaking, there's going to be a volume sales rise by 0.2% in 2022, that was last year, uh, and uh, it's around 4 million tonnes. Um, the trend for the next years is going to be to continue to grow, and uh, it's expected to increase to 4.2 million tonnes by 2026. So generally speaking, we see growth, we see some domestic production, yes, but generally speaking, a very reliant country on imports. Um, I wanted to explain a bit more in this part of the presentation, as I mentioned before, about how does the sourcing work? Do I work directly with importers? Do I work directly with supermarkets? As I said before, there are some supermarkets that I have started working directly um, 
uh, with with um, supplies and uh, this might be different to what you're seeing in other markets. I have to say that this is not um, the case for all the retailers in the UK. Some retailers might consider working directly with you, uh, but I have to say that most of them in the UK uh, prefer to work with uh, an importer that they already have a relationship with. Um, this, imp this importer have um, it can be external to the company or it can be part of the company. I have seen and we have seen that many UK retailers have sister companies that work as importers for a specific category. So it's in theory external, but it's in reality part of 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 of, um, of that retailer because it has been created by that retailer to basically deal with all the import of fresh produce. So many questions that importers ask me, uh, sorry, um, exporter ask, ask me uh, is, do I need a UK based importer? I have to say it's not a legal requirement. Uh, uh, so it, it just depends on what the retailers that you're going to be working with or the final customers that you're going to be working you uh, prefer. Uh, in most cases, retailers will tell you uh, if you contact them directly or, 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 or if uh, we contact them on your behalf, they will tell you how they prefer to, uh, to work. Um, I have to say that importers in general, whether they're external or part of the retailer, uh, they base their decisions on prices, uh, um, uh, when to source, where to source from, etc. They they base their decisions on the retailer's requirements. So most of the retailers are, uh, I'm saying retailers or, or the final customers, but retailers are the biggest ones here. Uh, they're the ones basically setting up uh, the rules that let's say that way in terms of pricing, what is expensive, what is not, uh, or what they can justify in terms of sustainability or labor practice in front of the final customers or not. Um, I have to say that all straight from our side, we're working together with a bit of everyone. We're working together with retailers, with final customers, with importers. We're trying to understand uh, and we've been progressing quite well in the last year. Uh, on on what they are looking for and and what the possibilities for Australian fruit fruit and drink uh, for, sorry uh, fruit and veg fresh produce in general uh, is. Um, having said this, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Anna just to get back on the outcomes of the free trade agreement. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thanks very much, Alberta, and we'll go to the next slide straight away. Uh, I think just briefly wanted to mention to you the opportunities that the FTA will create and hopefully will facilitate more flows of Australian exports. So first of all, tariff reductions. Um, we've got a couple of slides to follow with some examples, um, but you would have heard and seen that uh, most uh, tariffs on Australian uh, uh, food products have been eliminated. Some have transitional quotas um, over the next few years, uh, which will lead to them being, being reduced down to zero eventually. Uh, but for the uh, um, horticultural products, um, most of those tariffs have been eliminated on entry into force which was the 31st of May um, this year. So that's a great, uh, great result. And that means that we're in the past, you might have attracted a 6% or 12% tariff that's now zero. And we'll go through a couple of examples in a minute. Um, I think the other area that I wanted to come, uh, highlight is the simplified customs procedures, because we, we've, uh, we've heard a lot of feedback and you yourself would have experienced um, that often um, uh, products can get stuck at the customs and there's a lot of paperwork involved. So first of all, uh, both governments have worked very closely and the Australia's Department for Agriculture worked very closely with the UK um, counterparts to simplify the paperwork. So um, there's a lot less involved in producing that paperwork and Department of Agriculture um, is available there to help you produce relevant certificates, whether it's certificate of origin or any other documentation that's required. Um, so do reach out to them, do work with them, see what's now required, what has changed, but it is a lot simpler and we've already heard a feedback from exporters that it is a lot simpler and a lot easier in terms of the paperwork involved. And then also there are commitments about clearance of products at the customs. So there are commitments that perishable goods, which I think will apply to several of you on a call, will be cleared within six hours. And then all other goods, non-perishable goods will be cleared within the 48 hours, which I think is really important commitment to have and certainty to have um, uh, to ensure that your product gets to where it needs to in time and doesn't get um, damaged. Of course, this is subject to all the paperwork being filled out correctly. If it's not, then, you know, that, that becomes a bit more complicated. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please, Alberto, just a couple of examples. Um, 
limes. Um, I think Alberta mentioned already, um, or we'll talk a little bit about opportunities. Um, we, we are seeing opportunities in citrus and for something like limes, the tariff used to be 12% um, on Australian um, product. Now it's zero. Um, we've had a lot of feedback about uh, a demand for a berries um, and the tariff used to be 8% and now it's zero. Uh, next slide, please, Alberto. Um, avocados, um, I mean, the reduction might be not as huge. It used to be 4%, now it's zero. I'm personally been a big champion of the fact that uh, avocado, Australian avocados have a strong differentiating factor here in the UK. And given that UK sources most of the avocados from uh, other non-EU countries, there's, I think there's definitely opportunity there um, for Australian product. Um, cherries is another example where we had 8% and it's now down to zero. And we have seen interest from uh, UK importers in stone fruit. So there's definitely appetite there to explore that further. Um, kiwis, um, there's already um, some uh, retailers that are sourcing Australian kiwis um, that Alberta has been working with, and now with the reduction of tariff from 8% down to 0%, um, that could create further opportunities. Alberta um, uh, worked with a couple of onion suppliers and has facilitated recently um, uh, exports of Australian onions to the UK to meet some of the gaps in the market um, because the onions used to be sourced from Morocco and Spain and due to droughts, the supply from Morocco has been um, uh, limited. So uh, buyers are looking uh, to differentiate their supply and certainly we've already seen that Australia has a role to play there. And then we've got carrots that we used to be 12% um, down to zero and mandarins from 12% down to zero. So quite significant reductions there. I think something for you to think about as those tariffs are removed, who's benefiting from it? So is it about making your product um, cheaper and more accessible for UK consumers? Is it about helping you drive some of your margins up? So, you know, where in the past you might have been working with importers uh, and you had a very low margin. Now this 12% tariff reduction enables you to have a bigger margin, making it more profitable for you to do business um, with the UK. Or is it about really be having that negotiating power, being able to offer reduced prices to importers um, to get them to take more of Australian product? All of those scenarios are there in play for you to consider. Ultimately, it's your commercial decision, and it might, might be a little bit off are kind of playing in each of those three quadrants. Um, but I think we definitely want to um, want to encourage you to think about that and don't just automatically pass on the full, you know, 12%. Um, uh, think about your business and what you need and how it's going to make it more, I guess, attractive and profitable for you to do business with the UK, while also UK more, more attractive for UK to source um, from you. Um, and uh, then just quickly, I mentioned um, uh, the, the, all, everything that the FTA will do. I think it's important to acknowledge that the technical market requirements are still there. So um, the various requirements around having your product certified appropriately, they're all there. So um, <clears throat> Austrade works very closely with Department of Agriculture. Um, they're the experts um, in helping you understand the technical market access and various requirements. Um, there are some links on this slide that take you to the MyCor site um, that's managed by Department of Agriculture that really gives you that 101 information on what you need to think about by product category when you are starting to uh, ship and export your products to different countries. So I think that's kind of a first initial step. If you haven't exported to the UK before, you should go and review that information and and then you can also reach out to Department of Agriculture for any further questions. Um, they've got quite a lot of materials on their website um, about um, exporting from Australia, what to think about, step-by-step -step guide. Those materials are incredibly helpful, so I do encourage you to review them to make sure that you do meet all of the technical market um, requirements. Um, and of course, if you have any follow-up questions, they're the experts, but if you are not able to get in contact with Department of Agriculture, Australia can also help facilitate those um, inquiries through our channels and through our co contact um, at the department. And I think it's back to you, Alberto. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Really, uh, really interesting and I'm so very useful information for um, the exporters. Um, so 
<clears throat> as last part of my uh, presentation, I just thought it will be important for you to understand what the importers think. So, um, as I said before, <clears throat> we've been working with different UK based importers and also retailers uh, uh, about we've been talking to them about fresh produce from Australia and 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 we've been basically receiving some feedback. Uh, whether it was negative or positive, I believe it was important for you to understand how they think. And that's what I have tried to um, um, uh, reflect in this part of, of the presentation. But before we start and before we go into what the importers think, how the importers see um, Australian fresh British in general, I thought it would be important for you to understand who the main importers are, who are these people. And obviously, most of you might know the retailers. If not, I apologize. I haven't included them in here. But I thought it would be important for you to understand who the main importers of, of fresh produce are in the UK. And this, I would say, that these guys cover around 90 something percent of, of, of all the importers in, in, in the UK, especially people like uh, Beta Fresh, so you can see here, Nationwide, uh, Bar Foods, uh, The Groot as well, uh, IPL, which is uh, kind of a sister company from uh, a retailer called Asda, where some of you might know, uh, Worldwide Fruit and Bet UK. Those are, I would say, some of the biggest ones in the UK, uh, uh, but the others are also important working in different in different areas in, in market. So now that you more or less know, are you familiar with uh, who they are and you can you can understand, uh, uh, um, you can know their logos and maybe uh, uh, can understand uh, where they work in. Uh, I thought it would be important for you to um, get a bit of feedback. And, and this is, I insist, um, a summary of the feedback that we've been receiving from different importers, uh, from fresh producers, and I'm more or less uh, representing here and expressing here what they have been telling us. And what 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 we have received in terms of feedback is that um, probably nothing new, but Europe and South America are the main um, competitors for Australian fresh produce exporters. Now, something to highlight, especially here for South American supplying countries uh, around non-EU um, countries supplying the UK that I have mentioned before, and about how Australia can be uh, um, uh, competitive in other ways if if maybe compared to South America, we're not competitive in pricing, because that's what we're being told, we're being told as well, as I will explain a bit later. We, we can uh, be more competitive from the sustainable practice perspective, from the labour practice perspective, etc. Uh, furthermore, uh, furthermore uh, Anna has briefly mentioned on the onions uh, that some of these countries uh, uh, are suffering um, some challenges from uh, uh, from the climate perspective and, 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 and Australia having um, um, manage um, basic having having access to different products from different uh, parts of the country might be able to overcome this challenge. Uh, uh, but I would definitely highlight uh, the labour practices part uh, when talking to um, importers. Uh, price continues to be a very important aspect for the UK market, and this is something importers tell us. I'm afraid it's not something I'm, I'm just saying. Uh, so. There might be some kind of flexibility, and I know this might not be very popular to negotiate the price to maybe reduce the price compared to other countries, uh, because this is a very competitive uh, uh, market, and the price points have to be negotiated in most of the cases. I have seen negotiations of pricing going uh, going on for weeks uh, myself with different importers and with with Australian exporters, because uh, at the end of the day, they're looking for. I'm not saying the cheapest product, but they're looking they're looking for reduced prices in in many many categories. Uh, but again. And this is something that uh, importers are telling us. Uh, it is really important uh, to be able to explain how you are producing your product. Uh, so those practices uh, related to sustainability that you might be having in your um, um, in your farms uh, are really important. And you have to be able to demonstrate those, uh, maybe with certification or maybe with um, uh, your corporate source of responsibility program if you have one, etc. Something that I keep telling to some of these importers that, and, and, and you know this, we cannot change the fact that Australia is where it is, but we can change how we produce uh, certain uh, products. Uh, if we use less water, if uh, the energy you use uh, is uh, renewable energy, things like this. So we have to be able as Australian suppliers to demonstrate that because I believe uh, that we have a very clear competitive advantage in that. The importance of non-plastic. This is something importers are telling us as well. There's an, there's an increasing trend uh, in UK retailers to reduce plastic. So perhaps using alternative packaging will be very important as well. 
but also the UK consumer is more and more concerned about the trustability of the product. They want to know where this product is coming from. Uh, um, if it's coming from uh, a farm that is certified uh, in one way or another, and, and from which part of Australia is coming from, for example, from which part of the world. So this is really important. If you if you have any way of uh, um, giving the importer that information, that would be really, really important. And something I have mentioned before, uh, but I would like to highlight again, is label practice. Practices. And again, I believe this is a very good competitive advantage that we can have compared to um, uh, other countries, especially for non-EU countries. I'm talking about not having children working in your farms. I'm talking about uh, making sure that you pay the uh, the, the the right salaries. Uh, this is a trend. This is this is something I didn't see in the UK only a few years ago, and something that UK importers and retailers are asking more and more about it. Having said that, I just wanted to uh, highlight a few things uh, uh, here before going to uh, the last slide. Um, there's an increasing importance of non-EU supplies, especially for fruits uh, and also nuts, but especially for fruit. Uh, so again, something to consider here, how and to think to yourselves, how can we compete uh, or be um, offering a competitive advantage to UK importers uh, compared to other non-EU suppliers? Again, I'm sorry for repeating myself, but I would like to highlight these, highlight things like sustainability practices, label practices, etc. Avocados, stone fruits and citrus are the fastest growing categories in market. Um, the biggest current opportunities for Australian exporters, and this is something importers are telling me, uh, are about products like citrus, especially mandarins, I would have to say, but also lemons, onions, kiwi and berries. Those are the ones that in the recent conversations I've been having with UK importers, they have mentioned. Um, but also, I want to um, kind of ask an open question and, and the need for you to, as an exporter, to understand where Australian suppliers can play a role and understand the UK context. So, something we have understood, I believe, during this presentation, uh, but you have to ask yourselves as well, is who are the key players? We know most of them, but also what is the capacity? I ha you have to ask yourselves, what is your real capacity? Uh, and if I have the capacity to cover uh, a demand and to cover uh, um, um, the, UK, uh, the UK market. But again, uh, you have to understand your competitive advantage compared to other su uh, supplying countries, something I've mentioned before, sustainability related practices, label practices, but it's still think that price continues to be really, really important. So I know it's difficult, uh, but uh, there might be a way to find a balance and hopefully the removal of these tariffs will help to uh, uh, balance that price compared to other countries uh, to become more uh, competitive. On my final slide, I just wanted to mention uh, a couple of Im important things uh, for uh, the UK market. First of all is some trade shows, even though these trade shows, uh, the first ones in particular are not happening in the UK, they attract UK buyers. I experienced it myself last editions of uh, Fruit Logistica in Berlin, for example. Uh, I experienced it that many, many UK buyers, and most of the UK buyers were there. It's probably going to be the same in Fruit Attraction in Madrid, uh, next edition being the 3rd to 5th of October. Next edition of Fruit Logistica in Berlin being uh, 7th to the uh, 9th of February next next year. But also there are other smaller trade shows that are not um, related or exclusively related to fresh produce like IFE. This one is happening in London uh, and Australia. We are uh, also uh, participating in that next next year. Uh, it's not exclusively fresh produce related, but uh, we have had inquiries from fresh produce importers and also from retailers about fresh produce in this trade show in the past. And there are different ways of exhibiting in that. So we believe um, it could be for you of interest uh, as well to know that this is happening in, in March next year. And then um, I wanted to include yes and uh, some associations of interest. The biggest one, let's say that way, in the UK will be the Fresh Produce Consortium. Uh, um, uh, it works um, with UK, with some UK producers as well, but also it works with um, foreign um, um, uh, producers. Uh, and, and, and most of the UK retailers and UK importers of fresh produce are members of the Fresh Produce Consortium. So it might be of interest for maybe you to check because you, you might be able to find some interesting information in that. With this, uh, this is uh, the last part of my presentation, so really appreciate your attention and I'm going to hand over to the Horticulture Innovation. Uh, uh, we have Mila Bristow speaking in here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alberto. Um, I'm assuming you can hear me and everyone can hear me and thank you for operating my slide.
Right, so um, thanks for the introduction. My name is Mila Bristow. I'm the General Manager of Trade and Biosecurity Research and Development here at Hort Innovation. And Horticulture Innovation Australia is a grower-owned, not-for-profit research and development corporation for Australia's $16 billion horticulture sector. We service 37 uh, horticultural industries and approximately 12,000 Australian businesses that produce fruits, nuts, vegetables and other commodities, including turf and nursery products. And as you may know, Australia is an exporter of horticulture products and our imports of fruits and vegetables generally are counter seasonal. Um, Australia's top export destinations, I know this isn't our topic for today, is China um, it, and it is it remains to be China. So about a third of our um, produce goes to China. Um, with about 75% of our exports going to our near neighbours. And we will be talking about the UK for the rest of the talk. So I just wanted to flag that it's our near neighbours, which is our main export markets. Um, thanks for moving on to the next slide. So um, the, the project I'm going to talk to you about today is one where our growers asked for some better market intelligence to ensure their they've got the right, um, they're exporting to the right products to the right markets at the right time. So addressing the disruptions of COVID-19 and, and the trade related disruptions to that, Australia's ability to export and, and Australia's ability to export, we invested in a project to look at other diversified markets. Um, one of these projects was carried out by Deloitte, which was designed to assess the opportunities for rapid diverse diversification away from our main market um, and to expand other export markets. And that study identified 13 new markets. And to build on that, we then contracted Kantar. Kantar are a leading Australian uh, strategy house with brand and consumer expertise. And we asked Kantar to take a deep dive into consumers in these international markets um, to produce for Australian horticulture, new data and evidence-based insights that can um, really guide our diversification. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that consumer insight study today. Next slide, please, Alberto. So the question we asked or Kantar asked, and so I'm from the, you know, we contracted a delivery partner to do that. So I'm not the expert on this um, work, but I'm, I'm pleased to be able to put it in front of you today. And it, we will take further questions afterwards if there's any questions on the particular study. But we asked how Australian horticultural industries can unlock growth by generating consumer demand for 20 different categories across 13 different international markets for today and tomorrow. Thanks. Next slide. So the study provides a consumer-led perspective on the export opportunities for Australian hort, and it unpacks consumer attitudes and values and the consumer's fresh produce shopping behaviour and how they consume fruits, nuts and vegetables in each of the 13 markets. It provides a strategic lens on which markets represent the most attractive opportunity for each of the priority commodities, plus identifies which commodities have the strongest right to play in each market. Next slide, please. So the study looked at these 13 markets and you can see that they China's not included and I explained that is the, the, the purpose of the study was to look at markets outside of our a current number one export market for Australian horticulture. Next slide, please. And the commodities that we asked it to look at are the ones shown on the screen here. So fruits, nuts and vegetables. And some of the commodities that we talk about might consider themselves a, a, a fruit and some might be a vegetable. And there's reasons why we've put them together in different categories, which I probably won't go into today. Thanks. Next slide. So the study is just complete now and the results are actually presented in three uh, category markets. Fruits category, the nuts and dried fruit and the vegetables categories. Um, there's also 13 different market category reports. Um, next slide, please. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time now just skating across just the highest level consumer led insights for the UK market. Thanks very much. I'll just go to the next slide, please. So to get started, we Kentar asked three experts on their opinion of the UK fresh produce market dynamics um, as importers and in retail. And many of the messages you can see on this screen are what you've already heard from Alberto and Anna, that imports dominate the fresh press produce market with limited domestic production. There is um, 
a following for British produce and improvements in local production has extended the season for British produce. High level of imports means consumers in the UK lack an understanding of seasonality and expect produce to be available all year round. And Brexit has increased the import complexity and even played uh, um, and even the playing field for, for some exporters. Um, and there's also, which is interesting for Australians, is there's not strong, there are not strong perceptions of Australia and the ability to command a premium price for Australian produce is limited. Now, this is from experts in the UK. So this is just a snapshot of the sort of expert report. And for each of these reports, for each of the com um, commodities and for each of the countries that we showed on the slides earlier, there's a similar sort of report. Next slide, please. So the three key themes to unpack for consumers in the UK for each market were the demographics, attitudes and values and the shopping behaviours. And so, as you can imagine, each of the individual countries or markets are very different in their demographics, attitudes and shopping behaviours. So when we go to the next slide, thanks Alberto, the key consumer takeaways for the UK are for the UK, and you might see a little bit of a tone of comparison with some of the market other markets that were included in this study and that's because typically when people are reading when our horticultural industries are going to be reading these 2000 plus pages of reports they're going to be looking at more than one market so this is the this is the UK market so we can see in this situation supermarkets and discount bulk bulk food stores are the predominant channels for purchasing fresh produce that's the same as what Alberto has been talking about um, some interesting information we found from the consumers is that most households are spending less than £100 or approximately $180 Australian dollars on groceries per week. About a third of this is on fresh produce. That price is the strongest driver of fresh produce purchased and that eco factors or environmental factors are important for people when consuming, uh, when purchasing um, groceries and that's not different from the sort of information that um, Alberto has said, uh, shared with us from his source and his information. So if we just go to the next slide please. The commodity consumption data um, that I'll show is, is around a deep dive into data profiling of the priority fruits, veg vegetables and nuts uh, and the consumption, consumption moments that they have or the times at which consumers actually um, snack on or, or, or eat, eat the uh, fruits, nuts and vegetables we put in front of them. So the next slide, please. So I, I'm, I don't need to read all the slide there for you, but if you look at, um, we've got fruits, nuts and uh, dried fruit together and vegetables, and then um, a, a type of event about when they're um, consumed. So penetration refers to the number of times that that commodity or that um, category is purchased per week. Um, obviously, uh, fruits and vegetables, um, quite high at 84% penetration, 84 and 86%. They're mainly consumed um, fruits and nuts and dried fruit as a snack or sometimes with a meal, vegetables mainly at lunch. Um, how are they consumed? They're consumed fresh or fresh as part of a snack for dried fruits and nuts and vegetables fresh as part of the meal or when they're cooking. For all categories, consume, consumption is mainly at home and for all categories, the, the way that they're consumed is by themselves or with their spouse or partner. Thank you. Next slide. And the next um, area is around the commodity prioritisation. And this is the where we leverage the strategic framework to prioritise commodities based on these consumer be behaviours and perceptions. So the work matches what we understand from the consumer in that particular market, their demographics, the way that the consumers have answered the surveys around how and when they consume and at what, at what frequency with which they consume. And then it goes on to ask um, information around uh, the attractiveness of Australian export. And if I could just go to the next slide, please. So the key strategic objective of this research um, is to identify the most attractive Australian export commodities for UK consumers, and this particular report's the UK report, and there's two key access on which we evaluate that, um, and each is on the attractiveness and the Australian appeal. So you're going to see a two by two, um, which explains that. So the next slide, please. And if I just just um, deep dive into commodity attractiveness and Australian appeal, 
Um, there's some key drivers there. So unsurprisingly, potatoes and vegetables are the most highly penetrated commodities, followed by apples, olive oil and citrus in terms of how frequently um, they are purchased. Macadamia nuts have a strong Australian appeal for UK consumers, as do other dried fruits and almonds. Um, and raspberries are the strongest ranking for likelihood to pay more for a premium, premium commodity. And that's uh, really nice to see that, that um, both the ability to pay more um, also comes with a reduced or now a zero tariff on, on raspberries and a strong desire there. So for every of the, every single one of the commodities that I presented earlier on that slide, we have where they fit in terms of Australian appeal and also the commodities attractiveness. So there's a lot more, there's a lot of richness of information that I'm not going to go through. Yeah, thanks. The next slide's great. Thanks. Um, so we've plotted each commodity's metrics on a strategic matrix to identify the priority opportunities based on consumer preference and behaviour and come out of that with a long-term play, a strategic priority, a low priority or a low-hanging fruit in terms of where we suggest um, our commodities can play and where they're going to succeed. So if I could get you to go to the, the big reveal slide. Um, so this slide and for every one of the export markets in this study, there's one of these slides. And for every individual commodity in every market, there's one of these slides. And so in the two by two in the top right hand corner, you can see what we call the strategic priority commodities. And that's the future growth markets. That's not necessarily where commodities are today. And this isn't saying that those that any particular commodity is going to win or lose in that market. And the size of the bubble also represents the size of the price in turn, terms of penetration in that market. So what this um, slide actually points out is that um, that's the most attractive and appealing export opportunity based on consumer preferences and behaviour. So consumer led results, not necessarily related to any current buying. It's where the future growth opportunities are um, based on a lot of questions that are in this. And I'm summarising it really, really quickly. So that top pointy end of the strategic priority around where you can see olive oil, olives, citrus fruits, apple and strawberries. That does not exclude the other commodities from having um, low, um, the low priorities or the left hand side of the figure. It just says that there's other areas where or they might have um, less competitive advantage at the moment or that consumers don't find them attractive or appealing based on the questions asked in this particular survey. Thanks. If I could go to the end. The next slide, thank you, that's great. Um, so a quick summary, the study highlights that apples, olive oil, olives, citrus and strawberries all have good consumer-led prospects in the UK due to either their or both their attractiveness and their addressability scores. And you can see there's a lot of information there. And I'm not going to read all of that. I am, Alberto, going to ask you just to jump to my final slide, which is to say thank you. And it is a very quick skate across this new information that we've released in the last fortnight for our Australian horticultural industries. As I've said, there's over 2,000 pages of information on 20 plus commodities in 13 markets. It's a fair bit of information to digest. And we are currently over the next couple of months working with our industries to do that digestion of information and to see what sort of changes they might make to um, their export plans or export strategies. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks very much to for allowing us to share just a little bit of the sorts of research and development that we invest in to, um, partner with Australian horticultural industry so that they can understand what export looks like and, and where export growth could be. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Mila. It's fantastic. I mean, what a great piece of work. It's so exciting to see it. Um, uh, so I might invite uh, Mila, Alberto and Wayne to come back to the screen and um, we might stop sharing the slides so people can um, uh, see uh, everyone. Um, and, um, and we'll have a bit of a chat and um, we, we, uh, we've obviously had a lot of information to cover. So uh, we might go a little bit over time. I hope it's OK. People will be happy to stay with us on the line for a little bit longer because I think there's a lot to discuss. And of course, also, um, please, please put questions through in the chat function um, as I'll try and go through those as well uh, as I'm chatting to uh, Mila, Wayne and Al Alberto. And 
um, uh, look, Mila, I might actually go first to you on the back of um, what you've just shared with us, which is so exciting. Um, I think it's such a valuable, insightful report um, for people to review, and it's quite uh, exciting that you've looked at those um, 13 countries um, outside of um, our current close trading partners. And I think at Austrade, we often talk about the importance of diversification and kind of looking at, you know, we're already half close trading partners, but where else should we be playing um, around the world? Um, so I guess um, I, I appreciate there's a lot to review and a lot of information to get through, but I would be interested to, um, in your initial um, thoughts and insights about the importance of the UK market to this whole diversification um, play, like how important do you think it is for exporters to start considering um, doing business with the UK? Yeah, thanks, Anna, for the question. Um, there, I guess, in well, I'll start with in 2022, the total horticultural exports to the UK was just $3.6 million. Um, and that the five year um, current annual growth rate, CAGAR, to 2022 was actually negative. So it's actually been declining. So, um, and, but of those exports, it's almonds make up 42%, live plants, onions, and shallots make up um, the majority of it. In terms of how important it is, well, with 37 commodities and not all of them having like a strategic plan for export, but many of the bigger exporters do. Um, it's just apples and pears who currently have the UK as a priority market. Um, sorry, and I should add almonds. They also see it as a priority market, given that they currently make up 42% of our UK exports. Um, so I think a lot of our hort sector are interested in the UK. Um, but and I'm confident that the reduction in tariffs will get a little more interested. Um, but at the moment, it's very few of the commodities that have a priority for the UK. And I'll just give you one one reason for that. And because Wayne has got much more expertise to talk about the specifics on this. But just one more reason is the market. It takes us 42 to 52 days to see transport, and air freight is four times more expensive to get there. Uh, generally, we're more expensive than our competitors. And with a price driven market in the UK, whilst there are opportunities, there's still a lot of work for Australian horticultures to do. Um, and typically, we look at our near neighbours first because of the proximity. So um, that's just one reason, but I'll stop there. Um, no, absolutely. And I think uh, that it's definitely consistent with what we've heard as well. Um, and, you know, it's also, I think it's always good to go and test your product in markets that close by and markets that are a bit more, I guess, familiar um, before you go to somewhere like UK that's a bit more mature and experienced. And I think that was a really also good segue to Wayne, who's um, uh, Wayne. Alberta and I were very pleased when, when we read your article about the Australia UK FTA and what's in it for horticulture. I think it summarised things very well. Um, so I guess I'm keen to hear from you, I guess, what are your reflections on the opportunities um, for Australian horticultural exports to the UK, particularly after the FTA? Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, thank you for involving me here. It was interesting. Uh, as some of you know, and I go back a few decades now, in a previous life, I was involved in marketing of, say, stone fruit when the UK was our third largest market. We are involved in pioneering macadamia nuts into the UK, up to hundreds of tonnes. And I would really love to see this uh, FTA um, really kick some goals and try and return to that. But as Mila said, the CAGA well, growth, negative growth has gone from like 20,000 tonnes to under 1,000 tonnes uh, last year, most of that being onions and um, onions and almonds. The onions have probably got a good opportunity. Many of you have covered that. 8% um, tariff drops is good, but New Zealand had a free trade agreement at the same time, so that sort of negates that uh, advantage. But I think what the free trade agreement does do, which we found with our big free trade agreements in the Asian markets some a decade ago, we may not be the cheapest, but it does start to open some more conversations. And Alberto covered a lot of those sort of conversations that we may not be the cheapest, but we may be a little bit more interesting to some of the, uh, the buyers because of our um, credentials. 
important for us to realise some reality checks. We didn't have China the way we have it today. Stone fruit, I've just done a stone fruit report, 67% of our stone fruit went to China. 20 years ago, we didn't have China for a market. The UK has changed too. So much fruit is now coming in from Latin America, Peru and Chile. We are competing with them. So it is difficult to compete there. As I say, it does open up some conversations. I think citrus, you've highlighted that, Mila. I definitely agree that citrus and most likely mandarins because of its higher um, tariff reduction and also the way the market likes the easy peel fruit as opposed to the oranges. I think that has got a good opportunity. Um, but overall, some of the fruits like stone fruit, I think we can see some more stone fruit in cherries. Not huge because we have the reality that we are competing with South Africa and Latin America. Vegetables other than onions, carrots, you produce 98% of the, of the demand for carrots is in the UK. So to get them from the other side of the world, probably not going to happen. Um, but they're the sort of things. I, I definitely see citrus and I see some high value, high value um, perishable counter seasonal fruit. As long as we've got our eyes open to what Alberto was talking about, what competitive opportunity we can give to the retailers, because if we can't supply what they want, they don't have to buy from any of us. Um, absolutely, very well said, Wayne. And I think um, uh, one of the uh, things uh, is that it is a competitive market and there's certainly uh, the realities that you highlighted around us having other partners like China and Asia and the reality of where UK is sourcing is absolutely there. Um, one of the interesting trends talking to a few retailers is they now have um, very clear, uh, I guess, strategies around um, ESG. So not just kind of the, uh, the environmental factors, but the broader um, social responsibility strategies, which I think are pushing them to look at some of the other suppliers um, across the world that have some of more aligned um, values and more responsible practices. Um, so Alberta, I wasn't sure whether you wanted to expand a little bit more on what you've already presented on some of your slides about some of those areas, I guess, of opportunity and differentiating factors that we are hearing from, um, from buyers Australia might have. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and, and, and as I was saying before, this can, this can make Australian products more appealing, uh, uh, because in some categories, we cannot compete from the price perspective. As Wayne was pointing, uh, we're competing from non EU perspective countries with South America. Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen the prices from importers. Importers have told me, oh, you're offering me this price, but, uh, Peru or Chile are offering me this older price. So for certain categories, we certainly cannot, we cannot compete there from the price perspective, but there are other aspects I have mentioned, uh, labor practices. This is something, uh, importers are asking me more and more. Um, um, you are not mentioned as well, the corporate social responsibility strategies. They want to make sure what is this product giving back to the community? And this is something I I'm, I'm hearing more and more giving back to the community. So how is this company contributing to the local communities in general? Um, so any 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 program you have related to that will be really important to UK retailers uh, uh, and importers. Sustainability, no doubt. Uh, uh, do you have any program in place to reduce water consumption, for example? Do you have any program in place, uh, I don't know, to fight uh, dry seasons, for example, uh, to fight against uh, deforestation, uh, anything related to energy consumption as well? So. These are the main aspects I'm listening regarding in terms of like uh, corporate social responsibility. And I believe we have a very strong credential, uh, credentials in general. And uh, it's something we definitely have to include in our selling uh, speech. And I, I, I invite you to include and to think about it because sometimes we don't think about it. Think about it and think about how you, how you can integrate these points that I'm so most of you, you already have strategies like that in place and integrate it in, the, in, your, in, your, in your selling messaging. Thanks, um, Alberto. Um, there's a very, um, uh, I guess, uh, important um, comment in the chat um, about the commercial reality um, of, uh, I guess, doing business with the UK. 
and uh, particular, uh, I guess, uh, the uh, the uh, raspberries and commercial realities of that. I mean, uh, Jenny, happy for you to share the uh, the example, but uh, I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, what we we share in here is the opportunities that we are seeing based on data, is the feedback that we're getting from um, importers, distributors, from retail. Um, we're currently working very closely with a couple of retailers uh, to better understand their sourcing strategies and where the gaps are and um, you know this is what we're hearing from them uh, but yes I don't want to dismiss the fact that there are commercial realities and for different businesses it will come back to those um, uh, commercial um, I guess realities uh, and whether that is the right uh, if this is the right market and this is the right opportunity for you um, so I guess I wasn't sure whether uh, any of our panel members wanted to comment um, on 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 that um, aspect and um, add any further kind of insights commentary around that. Just a quick question to Alberto in your discussions then with the uh, retailers. I mean, do you see opportunities where they will have different categories of uh, fruit, for example, that meets a higher specification of social responsibility than, than others? So people can choose to have one fruit or another, or is that too much discrimination? I mean, I think this is more like a general trend. I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing from my conversation with retailers and importers, the possibility of having a, let's say, corporate social responsibility Apple and then not corporate social responsibility Apple. That I don't think that is a trend. I think this is more like a general trend. All the all the retailers in general are going through sourcing more responsibly, uh, yeah. and 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 I think I think probably it's just that they're trying to find. Uh, no one single supplier, but generally they're trying to find sustainable supplies in general. I don't think we will see a situation, if that's a question, Wayne, I don't think we'll see a situation in which we'll see uh, Australian apples and with all these corporate social responsibility certifications and then apples from another country with no certifications at, at all. I think I think the trend in general is just make yeah. it so they have as many credits as possible in general from the corporate social responsibility perspective. Yeah. No, good, good point and I just put it out there, but I, yeah. And and also yeah. because they're, they're trying to, I'm sorry for interrupting there, but in general, they're trying to build that that as part of the strategy, sourcing more responsibly in general. So I don't think they will highlight like these apples are not as corporate social responsible as compared to the other ones that you got next to them. Uh, so mm. it's just more general trend, I would say. I think what we will see um, uh, potentially, Wayne, is the, some of those um, more kind of premium retailers like Marx and Spencer and Waitrose and others, they they would be happy to, you know, pay, I don't know, they would be happy to um, potentially pay a bit more and absorb some of it, surpass some of it to a consumer, but they would be happy to sacrifice some of their profit to have that strong strategy that they can talk about. Uh, I mean, like Selfridges right. have this Planet Earth initiative, right? So they that's kind of their selling point. You might pay a bit more, but we have this Planet Earth initiative and this is what we're delivering under that. Um, so I think that's what we will see. I'm not sure what does that mean for Tesco's and Sainsbury's. I'd say they're a little bit behind on it, um, but some of those more premium retailers, I'd see that they'll be starting to be prepared to pay a little bit more to work with the right suppliers. Um, Jenny, you have your hand up. Thank you and appreciate the presentation today. I just, I feel like it's a very nuanced conversation. So we, raspberries were highlighted a couple of times for context. My name is Jenny van der I'm the export manager for Berries Australia. So I deal extensively in the category and in trade more broadly. We as industry have absolutely looked at these markets, but there are reasons why the trade doesn't take place. So as raspberries are an example, that's been brought up by the panel using this data, the average import cost or price that the UK is bringing raspberries into their market is about $11 per kilo. We need to be exporting it at at least $18 per kilo FOB. And as Miller just pointed out, the freight to the UK is four times anywhere else and it has to air freight or it doesn't get there in time and we don't claim the premium. So that maths, no matter how fluffy we make the story about good sustainability and paying labour, which is kind of an amusing conversation on the site anyway, 
Um, we, we can't dress that up enough to catch the price premium to make this a viable opportunity. Having said that, I think what's being missed here is that our growers are really clever people. And what a lot of them have done has been to invest in the development of intellectual property in the variety space. And they're in fact now growing these products in other countries closer to Europe so they can benefit from the opportunity to export those products back into the UK and to the EU using the Australian genetics, clipping the royalty off that. So that's what keeps our whole industry sustainable. So it's not just about the direct trade. Can we get it from Australia to the UK? Because in this case, the raspberry example, it's never going to add up, probably not across the berry category at all for that matter. But we're coming up with clever alternative ways to do that. And I just, I sometimes wonder if in these presentations, we're overselling to growers the idea that they should be trying to emphasize all their clean, green, safe credentials when the reality is we know that's not going to be enough to get them across the line in sales. The UK is one of the most price precious markets in the entire world. And quite frankly, the idea that they'd pay anything substantially more for a better product simply doesn't bear out in reality. So I, I kind of want to add, I mean, I know it sounds like I'm being a little bit skeptical here. I think that the free trade agreement is fantastic. It's a wonderful piece of work, but we just need to be careful how we counsel the broader industry on the reality of these opportunities. I'm happy, think it's like, I'm happy to yeah, respond go, to that one. Go, I just want to say thanks, Jenny. We really value that reality check, and it is really important to put this the reality lens on that. Um, we at Hort Innovation we have invested in a review of sustainability of how our industries measure and look at sustainability, and in that we've looked at where are the opportunities, where is the price premium paid for something that can be um, certified as sustainable, and we're not finding it yet. So, um, Jenny, there's the reality uh, to add to it, but. Um, in terms of, Jenny's talked about how exciting and how innovative the Australian horticultural producers, the sector, the growers and the industries themselves are. They are that, they're certainly that. They look at these sorts of opportunities and I'm sure they'll see what's the next opportunity for us to start to remove a barrier to trade. And at Hort Innovation, we've got our ears open. We're listening for what they are. We suspect they are in this space of ESG uh, in the future of embedding what we already do as our best practice on farm into something we market. Will that actually return? a price premium yet um i doubt it um and if it does i'm sorry for the uk we will probably be looking and testing that with our near neighbors because we've got the same questions in indonesia and in that in china in our biggest market so hopefully by testing it in our near neighbors where we currently already have um, you know, quite a, a ready trade that's so near um, nearby, we might be able to test where there is a price premium. Um, but look, again, there'll be some more questions in that space and we're happy to be looking with our levied industries to to um, to partner in R&D to remove any barriers. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think we've had some great examples from um, other industries um, uh, as well. Uh, you know, we are we quite fortunate here in the UK to be able to eat pink lady apples that are produced in the UK during one seasonality and then uh, during the other alternate seasonality that actually are imported because obviously um, it is a seasonality play as well here uh, in market. So we have pink ap uh, lady apples all year round, uh, but half of that uh, a year they are imported and then half of that year they're actually produced here and I think uh, 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 our, our, our um, Apple Apple Association done an amazing job uh, equipping UK farmers to grow um, uh, pink lady apples which is another great example of of the innovation and uh, an alternative strategy that could be implemented um, in in the market such as the UK um, I think probably just to um, respond uh, Jenny really appreciate your honest feedback I think it's important and I think that's why it will vary category by category and different categories um, might have different strategies. Um, and this is also why we have in strategic conversations with the likes of Marks and Spencer, because we are not in a position to sell them everything. We don't want to sell them everything. We want to understand where the gaps are, right? And so we're having strategy meetings with them where we're talking to their buyers about, so where are the gaps, where you're prepared to pay premium, where it is important to you, and therefore where Australia might be able 
um, to fill that gap. And then we can present that back to the Australian suppliers and see if that's of interest. And, you know, and the answer might be actually, no, it's not of interest because we're still getting better price or better results somewhere else. But then for some, it might be actually, this is a great opportunity um, for us to explore in the UK uh, market. Um, I'm just conscious of time, um, so we might move to the next question. Um, uh, there's a question there from Mimi, if there are any examples or learnings we've gained from working with other agri-food industries that we can learn from for the horticultural sector. I'm not sure, Alberto, if you want to talk about any other sectors that you work with and any learnings there that could be applied. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, I'll say that generally speaking, compared, I mean, compared to other food and drink products, uh, let's compare it to wine, for example. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, it's also a very competitive uh, one, and it's also very price driven, uh, and and and. Um, also linked to the wine industry, but linked to what Jenny was saying. I mean, um, sustainability credentials, labor practice credentials, those things are really important, but it's still, uh, 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 it's a very price driven market. Uh, and, and that's going to make the difference. Yes, sustainability credentials and all the credentials you can sell are really, really important, but that's not going to make a buyer of wine, for example, or a buyer for fresh produce to pay whatever price you're asking for. Uh, so really, really well spotted that Jenny and, and actually that's true. It's just still very price driven. Uh, um, and I compare it to wine because also many wine importers are bringing that product from South America, Spain, other markets. It might be a similar situation. Uh, many, many players in the industry, uh, and 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 basically, it we have to be able to identify where the opportunities are. And as Anna was saying, and this is similar to the wine industry understand what the buyers are looking for. And this is part of our conversations we are having with different buyers across across the fresh produce uh, uh, industry. Understand where the gaps could be, understand what uh, uh, they might be looking for from Australia in the same way that we're doing it for wine. Uh, just not trying to offer them everything we have because we understand that's not possible. Uh, but again, keeping in mind that it's a very price driven market. Um, yeah, and I guess maybe just to kind of highlight, uh, you know, how to, you know, how to, what, how do you succeed then? I think uh, it's uh, if you have some, if you're offering something that's different, unique, uh, whether it's different and unique to Australia or whether it's uh, different and unique from um, a premium or quality perspective, uh, but that's what works. So if you can sell the differentiation point, whether it's wine, whether it's fresh produce, whether it's seafood, if you can somehow demonstrate that it's um, different, uh, then that typically gets the cuts through. Or if we're looking to address a gap, um, whether it's a seasonality gap or whether it's a gap generated in market due to short shortage of supply from elsewhere um, across Europe or the world, um, I'd say that they're the areas where that we can really, um, um, I guess, address. Um, uh, Wayne, I guess uh, I think you you do a lot of work across industry and uh, and different markets. Um, so I thought maybe we go to you for our final question and comment. Is there anything you wanted to highlight in terms of uh, kind of any differences, both positive and negative plus and minuses of um, doing business with the UK versus some of the other markets. Um, kind of what's your view, um, um, you know, on trading with the UK versus some of the others? Thank you. Well, I probably covered what I wanted, needed to say before. Really done a lot of interrogation of the data to try and find those opportunities. Broad picture is that anyone going to the UK has to really be committed long term. It's not an in and out quick quick fix unless it's in for a specific part of the season. I have to say I'm probably don't want to put rose colored glasses over all this. We're a long way away. We are more expensive. The opportunities will be in the short term highly perishable premium priced um, products to start with. And uh, yeah, I, I think there's there's certainly some opportunities where we see the bigger bigger tariffs coming down. And also, we really have to look at what the competitors are doing. For example, even with avocados, Chile is reducing their long-term production of avocados. That will have an impact on the whole global supply chain. And our 
increasing in production might be bringing the price levels down. We're not necessarily looking at premium prices. So it's it's those sort of things and it's you know, right across the whole uh, whole scheme of different horticultural products. So not a, not a one size fits all by any means. Um, but certainly those with the bigger tariff uh, lines coming down, citrus as you've highlighted, uh, and robust fruit that will go the distance by sea. Yes, stone fruit would have some opportunities, but then you've got the social responsibility when they go put, a, put them in a plane for 24 hours, doesn't cut it very well in the UK anymore. So. Thanks, um, Wayne. I think that's a great uh, summary and a great um, way to finish the session. Um, I can see there's a question there about the associations of importers. We'll send you the link as, links as a follow up. There's a couple of different associations uh, in the UK, so we can follow up with those um, links and information. Um, so, yeah, so I think on this note, I uh, will wrap up. I would like to uh, very much thank our, our panel. So thank you very much, Wayne, for your insights. Um, thank you very much, Mila, for your insights, sharing the report with us. Um, but also um, thank you for partnering with us on the delivery of this. Um, Austrade are here to support your efforts. Um, yes, UK is not an easy market, um, but uh, there is an opportunity here. Um, um, so we're here to work with you, help you explore where those opportunities might be specifically for your product. Products, um, and whether they are realistic opportunities for you to, to, to explore. So please do reach out to our team in Australia, Phil and his team to start those conversations. And then um, Alberto and I and others will be here on the receiving end to explore those um, further with you. Um, so thanks very much, everyone, and um, have a good evening in Australia and have a good day in the UK. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Alberto. Thanks, team.